The Apostle John writes, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He then said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was distressed that he had said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Amen, amen, I say to you. When you were younger, you used to dress yourself and go where you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. He said this signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had said this, he said to him, follow me. This is the truth. Peace be with you. Today in the gospel, we read this dialogue between Peter, who denied Jesus three times, and Jesus, who offers to Peter three times love, saying, do you love me? You've denied me three times. Now I want you to profess your love for me three times. Now, we also see, if we look at the Greek, that there are two different words for love. There's agape, a life-giving, self-sacrificing love, and there is philia, a friendship love. And so Jesus says, do you love me enough to lay down your life? And Peter says, I love you as a friend. Jesus says, do you love me enough to lay down your life? Jesus says, I love you as a friend. Jesus says, do you love me as a friend? Peter says, you know that I love you as a friend. So Peter is still weak. His love is still imperfect. He does not yet have the Holy Spirit that is able, as we see in this first reason, first reading from the Ephesians, to turn us from the spirit of this world to the spirit of God. So he's still weak, but God accepts his weak love. God accepts his perfect love. But we see Jesus talk about love three times. Now, I would like to make an analogy and say that mothers have to love their children in three different ways. In three different ways corresponding to three ways that Jesus tells us to love other people. To love your neighbor as yourself, to love your enemy, and to love the poor. To love your neighbor as yourself, to love your enemy, and to love the poor. So first, when a woman is pregnant, when she is uh, first a mother, she has this child very close to herself. There is no one more a neighbor than the child in your womb. There is no one that you must like, that you must love as yourself, as the child who is in yourself, as this child who is physically inside of you, as this child who relies on you, who what you eat, they eat. And so we see that this first phase is loving your neighbor as yourself. The second phase is loving the poor. 
So this child is born and he is or she is helpless. They rely on you. They are naked. They are hungry. They are thirsty. They are strangers. Even you put them in a little crib, it has bars. In some way, they look like prisoners. And in all of these ways, a mother must love the poor. She must care for those who are poor, particularly her children. She teaches them who are poor in speech. She teaches them who are poor in understanding. She teaches them who are poor in morality. And they grow up and grow up. And then, as the child becomes older, occasionally the mother will have to love the child even when the child is acting as her enemy. Even when the child says, I hate you. Even when the child robs her or lies to her or breaks her heart. Even if the child goes on to a life of crime, goes to prison, still this mother loves this child. And so we see these three ways that Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, love the poor, love your enemies, that all three of these are fulfilled in motherhood. Now, for children, for children, we are told to obey our parents, our mother and our father, and we are told to honor our father and our mother. And so there is a transition. When we start as infants or in the womb, our mother knows more about the world than we do and more about us than we do. You might remember a child saying to you, mom, do I like spaghetti? And the mom says, yeah, I think you like spaghetti. Oh, okay. And then the child eats because they don't even know what it is that they like. They don't know about themselves. Or when a baby is crying or when a child is crying, they say, the mom says, where does it hurt? And the child says, I don't know, it just hurts. They don't even know where their pain is coming from. And so this mother knows more about the world and more about the child than the child does. As the child gets older, into tween and teen years, the child begins to know more about themselves, more about their own body than their parents do. The parents know in general the theoretical knowledge, but the children know the day-to-day -day knowledge. Oh, I stubbed my toe. Oh, something smells. Oh, something aches. Oh, this, oh, that. They know these things. And so there is this transition. And then, as you move into the college years, you start to say, well, maybe I know more about accounting than my parents do. Maybe I know more about car buying than my parents do. Maybe I know more about politics than my parents do. And so the child starts to know more about the world and more about themselves than their parents do as they're getting older. And then finally, Finally, when the parents get so old, the child begins to know more about their parents than their parents do. The child begins to say, this is the medicine that you need to take. You can no longer drive. You need to move out of your house into our house. You need to do this. You need to eat your vitamins. Why? Because the child knows more about the parent than the parent does. The parent is growing weaker physically and mentally. And in all of this, we must have this love for our parents, our mothers and our fathers, and we must have this honor. So we obey them, and then we honor them. There is this transition. There is this flow. 
And as we get older, this relationship with our parents changes. This relationship with our parent changes. Now, all of this teaches us about God's love for us. About God who loves us because we are close to him. Who loves us because we are poor. Who loves us even when we are his enemies. And how we are called to obey him and to honor him. Although he will always know more about us and more about the world than we do. In our mothers, as in our fathers, we have our first encounters with love. And these encounters with love help us to receive God the Father's love. God the Father's love, which is so often described as the love of a mother. Jesus says, I wish I could gather you under my wings like a hen gathers her chicks. God in the Old Testament talks about how like a mother's love for her child, like how a mother almost never forgets her child, even more so than that, God never forgets forgets us. My brothers and sisters, I give thanks for my mother, for Mary, my mother, for all of the mothers in our parish, and I ask for God's blessing upon them. I pray also for all those who are struggling, those who have lost children, those who are unable to have children. I pray for all the mothers around the world, those who are poor and who wish that they could provide more for their children, those who have sacrificed everything for their children, those who have left behind old worlds for their children. And I pray for all of those children without mothers, that when we encounter them, we may be mothers and fathers to them. And I pray that through knowledge of our mother's love, we might know the love of God.